Pre-hospital CPAP use is not only reducing intubations and hospitalizations, but it's also saving lives. Let's talk about CPAP and how it works. In this GEMS article by Dr. Marvin Wayne, we talk about the many benefits of continuous positive airway pressure, or CPAP as we like to call it. Now in the field, we usually have a mask device with a T-piece and a head harness that goes around our head, it goes down through a big tube to some sort of device. It'll be either a generator of sorts, a, uh, a ventilator, a venturi, something that's plugged into our oxygen source and what's providing the pressure against the patient's face. Now, these are usually set between five and 10 centimeters of water, and that's just a pressure measurement. It has nothing to do with water itself. There's no water in these systems at all. Some of these will go down to zero all the way up to 20 or more for CPAP, but usually in the field, we'll see between five and 10. Now, what does that mean? When I breathe in normally, I create a negative pressure space inside of my lungs. That's what sucks that air in. It also brings blood back towards the heart. When I relax, I'm breathing out because there's positive pressure inside my lungs. Now it's blowing out. Now with CPAP, I'm getting a constant pressure against my lungs. That means that there's going to be more positive pressure inside my lungs during respiration. So when I breathe in, there's positive pressure pushing air in instead of me sucking it in with negative pressure. Then when I breathe out, I'm pushing against pressure. What that also means is in my intrathoracic cavity, I have increased intrathoracic pressure. Increased intrathoracic pressure. That's gonna become important here in just a moment. So let's rehash through the cardiopulmonary system. So I like to divide this into the right side of the heart, the lungs, and the left side of the heart. So the body returns blood to the heart on the right side, and that's called venous return or VR. It's gonna go up through there and then through the right ventricles into the lungs. In the lungs, we do our oxygen and CO2 exchange, then it goes back towards the left side of the heart, and then it goes through the left atria and ventricles, kicks through the aorta, back out to the body, and then continues that cycle, right? This over here, that the left side of the heart has to push against that resistance left in the system, is called SVR, systemic vascular resistance. It's also often called afterload. That's the pressure that the heart is pushing past to be able to, to flow blood. That, that pressure is left in the system that it has to overcome to flow that blood, all right? Now, in a patient who has chronic PVD, peripheral vascular disease, uh, a, a patient that has chronic hypertension, stuff like that, the left wall of the heart will increase in musculature because it's trying to overcome that excessive SVR. When it's doing that, that muscle is growing, 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 but then it loses its ability to be elastic and to be able to expand and contract as much as it used to because the more muscle that exists, the less flexible that muscle itself actually is. So that means that the volume that you used to be able to fit into the left ventricle is not going to be there as much. There's not as much volume that is going to be able to fit in there because there's less elasticity. Because of that, it becomes a log jam effect here, all right? It's the same thought process as, let's say you're going down the highway and there's a three lane highway and a car crash takes up two of the lanes. People are still able to drive past on that one lane that's open, but everything starts to back up. Traffic starts to back up because even though there's one lane open, there's not as much passage able to happen, right? So that means traffic is gonna back up through the lungs because the right side of the heart is still pumping like normal. It doesn't have any increased vascular resistance through the lungs. And so it's 
pushing the same amount of blood through, all right? That means that we're gonna have increased blood pressure in the lungs, and that's called pulmonary hypertension. And so that's gonna be because of that ventricular hypertrophy on this side. Now, one result of that, that pulmonary hypertension is something called pulmonary edema. A way I like to describe pulmonary edema is using toilet bowl. So the tank of the toilet is like the right side of your heart, all right? The left side of your heart is that plumbing down here, okay? When the left side of the heart stops working very well, and it forms more of a, a clog there, per se, that means that the toilet bowl, which would represent your alveoli and your lungs, starts to back up because every time you flush it over and over and over, it's going to increase in that volume of, of liquid that's displacing the airspace inside that actual toilet, right? Okay, so that means in these alveoli right here, that in pulmonary hypertension, those capillaries are going to start leaking fluid into those alveoli. That de decreases the usable airspace inside the alveoli. It decreases oxygenation of our patient, it causes lots and lots of problems, all right? So what's happening is the capillaries line up against the airspace of the alveoli, all right? And generally, we have oxygen and CO2 passing back and forth between the two spaces, right? So the CO2 is leaving the capillaries and then oxygen is coming from the air spaces into the capillaries to oxygenate our blood. Well, water does not normally pass across that membrane, but it's a very thin membrane. And when we increase our pressure inside of this space, it forces some water across into the airspace. So we start to get water on the lungs or pulmonary edema, all right? our air spaces start to fill up with liquid, that pulmonary edema. So our solutions, we have some pharmacological solutions, things such as giving a, uh, an ACE inhibitor, a beta blocker, a nitroglycerin, all kinds of different ways. We're not gonna talk about those today. We're only gonna talk about CPAP's effect, its positive effect on CHF itself, okay? So we talked earlier about vascular resistance, or excuse me, venous return going up into the right side of the heart, right? We talked about how when you take a breath in, it increases that venous return to the heart. Well, by applying CPAP, we actually decrease the venous return to the heart, which means that the right ventricles aren't pumping as much blood. Because they're not pumping as much blood, we have a decrease in this pulmonary hypertension that's across here. So your pulmonary hypertension is going to decrease because we have less vascular resistance. Okay. On top of that, the overall cardiac output is going to decrease for some interesting reasons. So one of those reasons is because the baroreceptors that are inside the aorta, and a baroreceptor is a pressure receptor, those baroreceptors are going to detect that increased intrathoracic pressure. They're going to tell the heart, hey, chill out a little bit. All right. It's going to decrease your inotropy, your chronotropy, all the tropies, dromotropy, everything's going to decrease with the activation of those baroreceptors because the aorta thinks that it's got excessive blood pressure, but it's actually being squeezed from the outside, not from the inside. It's kind of interesting. And then another thing that's going to happen, that fluid we were talking about that, that is inside those alveoli, it's actually washing out surfactant, which decreases the amount of open alveoli that we're going to have. And there are stretch receptors inside the lungs. And those stretch receptors are actually going to start producing more surfactants to help keeping the, keep the alveoli open. And they also are going to decrease our cardiac output. And then the last thing, of course, is additional oxygen being forced in. It's going to be able to push past and expand those spaces. And we're going to be able to have more oxygenation. All right. It works very, very well. CPAP is an amazing tool in the CHF patient. So another thing that's going to happen, again, we have our airspace. We have our capillary space right here. Another thing that's going to happen is we're going to increase the pressure in this airspace, which will match that increased pressure in the capillary space. 
and it's going to start migrating that water back. So the pulmonary edema itself is going to start migrating back into the capillary beds, all right? So we're decreasing the amount of pulmonary edema in these acute CHF patients. It's phenomenal. Cool, let's talk about COPD now and how COPD and, and asthma as well, which is a similar process in the lungs, not disease process wise, but it's similar in what kind of happens and how uh, CPAP helps in that situation. So in both COPD and asthma, the mucosa in the bronchioles actually starts to get inflamed and it narrows the bronchioles. It narrows the amount of air that's able to get in through the bronchioles into the alveoli themselves, all right? Uh, then in, C, uh, in COPD, not in asthma though, uh, we start to develop mucus plugs. And those mucus plugs start to fit inside here and decrease again the actual volume of air that can pass through these lungs, all right? So let's talk about what actually is happening with CPAP. So we have our mucus plug here, and then we have our narrowing of the airways here. So our actual airway space is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. All right, so that's why these patients are getting hypoxic. They're having a hard time getting air to flow inwards. Let's change that. They're having a hard time getting the air to flow inwards. And they're also having a hard time to get the air to flow outwards, all right? So because of that, when we add CPAP to the mix, what we're starting to do is stint the airways open. We're applying pressure from the inside to push it out. So it's easier to blow out air and it's easier to take in air because we're applying that pressure right where it's narrow and we're keeping it open so it doesn't collapse. In a sick COPD or asthma patient, the airway with big breaths, it actually will start to collapse. So we're helping prevent that collapse. On top of that, these patients, we're getting them more oxygen and then also we're giving them more of whatever bronchodilator like albuterol that you may be using and we're getting it deeper into the system. It's not getting clogged up by this spot right here. It's actually able to push its way past. Now, when these things start to, to collapse, I was just talking about how big breaths, they start to collapse. Well, the bronchioles aren't the only thing that start to collapse. The alveoli start to collapse as well. And CPAP will increase the recruitment, which basically means increase the number of alveoli that we're using because we're stinting those airways open. It's a fantastic tool for both COPD and asthma as well as CHF. So make sure, that you read uh, the, the many benefits of CPAP uh, by Dr. Uh, Marvin Wayne and make sure that you, you study through that. It's got some great information. If you guys want some more of this information and you enjoyed this video, make sure you click the like and the subscribe button and go ahead and follow us. Thanks for joining.